Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Welcome back to My Digital World, brought to us by Tempest Network, a Burkan World project. And welcoming back to the segment is our regular contributor, CEO of Tempest Network and founder of Burkan World, Shahal Khan. Today, he is joined by Robbie Young, returning guest, CEO of Animoca Brands, a global leader in blockchain games. Now, today we are chatting about about the earning potential surrounding blockchain gaming, how to engage with the play to earn models, the new economies that can be created in the era of Web 3.0, and how this can revolutionize education, charity, and gam gamified earning. Now, as they get settled into the broadcast room, let's review some basics. User statistics show the rapid pace of adoption of blockchain gaming and the number of daily unique wallets interacting with game-related smart contracts surged to 1.3 million last year. That's a 46-fold increase over the 28,000 at the end of the year 2020. Think about that. And one area of the digital asset industry is ahead of the games with exponential growth, blockchain-based gaming. Now, although token prices for leading blockchain games like Axie Infinity have fallen recently, the user metrics are up. Mind you, this growth is quite impressive given that it takes time to build great games. Actually, in traditional industries, it takes two to four years to build a great game. Now, meanwhile, venture capital firms have invested about $4 billion to support the development and creation of blockchain-based games and their underlying infrastructure. And here to chat some more are Shahal Khan and Robbie Young. Welcome back, gentlemen. Thank you, Zen. Hi, nice to meet you. All right, Robbie, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the very the popularity of play to earn gaming powered by cryptocurrency rewards picked up in last year of 2021 with the Pokemon inspired Axie Infinity leading the way and the AXS tokens really raking up impressive gains. And the play to earn game is ranked the second largest game using user it's 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 sorry try to thought it's large it's ranked the second largest game using blockchain technology mm -hmm. by user base becoming a hit among the lower income populations mm -hmm. in the philippines and venezuela right yeah. so uh, it, it reached a record high of 2.5 billion in trading volume in september and surpassed sales records of nba top shot and even crypto punks um from your point of view can this be a pathway out of poverty for some Definitely, definitely. Well, I think what's happened with, with play to earn gaming is that we've essentially found a very interesting business model um, that can be taking place inside an entertainment product. Um, and it's a business model that makes sense at a certain where where that income level is material. So I think where Axie Infinity has done an incredible job is in appealing to people, as you mentioned, particularly in the Philippines and Venezuela, is because the amount of income that you can generate through play inside the game is, you know, by North American standards, for example, relatively small. You know, you're talking about um, $5 a day, $10 a day. Um, and that's an amount that is very material to people in some countries and a reasonable alternative to other forms of work, which is where we come up with the, the term play to earn. Exactly. And that play to earn is now revolutionizing a lot, which is going to bring me into my next very, very specific question for Shahal. So Shahal, a dataverse providing unbounded access to information for all is really only um, going to emerge from a mature data economy where data can be fluidly valued, purchased and utilized seamlessly. Unfortunately, until, until recently, the data economy has looked more like a barter system where each transaction is opaque and slow. And rather than being distributed, most data related value is instead concentrated in a few in a few monopolies. OK, but the rapid adoption of blockchain technologies has made it clear that this is changing. And Web3, the decentralized internet built on the back of the blockchain technology, shifts ownership and power back to users and away from monolithic platforms like Facebook and Google and Amazon. So in a world where people own the platforms they use, earn money fairly for content they generate, and are sovereign over their data rather than held hostage by it, is a very revolutionary, re revolutionary model. Talk to me about how this can create a creator economy and how this is going to revolutionize things. Yeah, Zen, um, well, I mean, thank you for, for, for that lead up and, you know, the information that you're providing your listeners in terms of the actual environment is, is crucial. Um, so um, the way that I look at this is, 
um, there's going to be a massive need for retraining of the world's populations in the West as um, a lot of the sort of jobs as we go forward over the next few decades that um, people are used to having an income from go away and they're replaced by um, robots, AI, um, you know, technical innovation. So there's a segment where there's going to be a population in the West that is older and that population will not have the physical attributes, let's say, to go out and do the same sort of jobs they were doing before. And there's a need for them to be able to participate, still earn an income. There's a big issue in the West with inflation due to debt. And uh, people will just need to continuously earn money. There's going to be possibly for a large segment of people in the West, no such thing as retirement. And at the moment, the closest thing to augmenting their incomes without putting strain on governments is going to be uh, sovereignty over their data and also for them to maybe enter gamified work environments where they could actually um, participate and collaborate using their attention, using their engagement, um, that, uh, you know, programs that are created by corporations or by individual DAOs or communities and participate with their data and their time and literally use it as sweat equity. Um, and within the community, if that happens and their audit of their time, their activity is placed on a blockchain um, and it's, uh, let's say, um, acknowledged by the rest of the community, it becomes a form of tradable income that now can reside within a digital asset. You may call it a currency or coin that's accepted by the, 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 the community. And it goes beyond just the, let's say, in-game play to earn, but now it becomes more of a work and engage and earn within a metaverse or a community. And I think that's very important in order to help um, income uh, and also sustainability um, in the West and, of course, in the East. Uh, you know, I think the East and the sort of work that Animoca and Axie Infinity have done has started essentially people becoming aware that they are able to have um, um, income coming in from an activity directly. And that now needs to expand. It's very well said. It was That was a perfect statement because now we're going back to the notion that users who are then sovereign over their data can choose to freely trade or commodity commodity you know to, or monetize their data giving rise to a rich data economy which is what the point here is now i'm going to shift back to robbie uh, one obstacle to further adoption is the reputation <clears throat> of cryptocurrencies among many traditional video game players okay and the mm -hmm. blockchain gaming industry has faced criticism from traditional gamers and many think that gameplay for these projects has a long way to go that the next phase of growth might come only after existing games deliver and the infrastructure evolves further um, the tokens of several play to earn games have suffered large price drops this year as really broader cryptocurrency markets have trended downward, leading us to think that maybe they don't trade so independently after all. What do you say to this, Robbie? Sure. Um, I think, first of all, the most important thing to think about is the fact that we're very early. Um, so, you know, most people only became aware of NFTs and the idea of using blockchain in games after uh, NBA Top Shot came out into the market. So we're talking about, you know, a little over a year ago, really. Um, and so we're very early days. Um, I think we've seen some incredible products out there demonstrate what are essentially, you know, the best proof of concepts you could ever think of. So Axie Infinity is an incredible success story in the game industry, but as a game itself, um, you know, it's it, it was developed by people who were, avid gamers and blockchain fans, but originally they were not a game development studio. Um, you know, they came together for the purpose of building this. And so they've done the best they can and they built a really compelling game, but it's not, you know, if you're expecting something like you're going to play on your Xbox or PlayStation, that's not the kind of experience that Axie Infinity is. It was designed as a different kind of product. So I think that now that, um, you know, blockchain, this intersection of blockchain and games is more in the mainstream spotlight. And we see a lot of companies, um, you know, being funded uh, for the last 12, 18 months to build great games on blockchain. I think you're going to see a lot more familiar gameplay style experiences. Um, you know, we're, we're in the process right now of, of launching our Phantom Galaxies, which is a console title, AAA console title. Um, 
and and PC web title um, that has the kind of graphics I think that people might be more familiar with, um, you know, real sort of 3D highly rendered graphics. Um, and so I think you'll see more of these products coming out over the next six months. Um, but a lot of the criticism levied at the industry at the moment um, from traditional gamers is because I think they're forgetting just how early it is. I mean, if you think back to what a mobile game was like in 2009, that's when we were still mostly, you know, pretending we were drinking a beer on our smartphones um, <laughs> and, and Angry Birds hadn't come out yet. And, you know, it's, it's very early days. So I think you have to take it with a grain of salt. And as you said, Zen, the fact that Axie Infinity create, you know, was a game that in September traded over two and a half billion dollars worth of value in their game. And yet it's, you know, a very, very nice early stage proof of concept of what you can do with blockchain in a game. I think that's amazing because that hints at a much bigger future. Yeah, well, you said it. Listen, we have about a minute left. I'm going to cut to a commercial break, but I do want to actually go back to, um, you know, look, NFTs in gaming appear, you know, much less affected by macroeconomic events and tend to trade more independently, right? And we've seen the the adoption of blockchain games has been driven in part by the ability of players to have digital ownership over, you know, in-game assets. And this is a huge shift away from the typical centralized Web2 models that have really dominated the industry to date. So I think we're definitely headed in the right direction place. And of course, Animoca Brand's always at the forefront of everything. I'm going to cut to a commercial break, but we'll come back and we'll chat a little bit more. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WR, the voice of New York. That was Shahal Khan and Robbie Young from Animoca Brands. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Now, welcoming back to my digital world segment is CEO Shahal Khan and Robbie Young from Animoca Brands. And we're picking up our conversation around blockchain gaming and how it's revolutionizing Web3. Now, Shahal, to provide a true peer-to-peer multi-token network in a true sense, it's metaverse, where projects and individuals can co-create and bring their participative energy is essentially the foundation infrastructure needed to deliver the Web 3.0 promise. But while we've seen unprecedented growth in the token-driven economy and exponential growth in, in investment and valuation of these projects, I think many of these projects neither embody the Web 3.0 principles of participation nor have an economic output that adheres to Web 3 tenants. The fundamental ingredient lacking, in my opinion here, is participation. What do you say to this? As... Um more environments are developed, uh, interactive AR sort of environments are developed and um, visual, uh, let's say, aspects of the metaverse are developed. You have to develop the capability almost at a programmable, granular level of developing these games where, for example, let's say a person's digital identity is tied to the digital avatar, which is connected to, let's say, a, a DeFi digital wallet they have that um, enters into a gaming environment, they're recognized by the gaming environment, their actions are now validated and recorded by the gaming environment. And if they so desire to, let's say, participate in, in an activity that's monitored, um, you know, based on their data privacy acceptance, and um, they're given a value for that. And that could be anything from touching a branded product to participating in a challenge but this is all done in an AR you know, uh, world where it's interactive between the real world and let's say the metaverse world and a world which has the actual financial or DeFi system integrated within it because that's really what it's becoming. It's becoming a almost intelligent system that recognizes and values a person's data as well as their actions, as well as their outputs, right? And now... Um, uh, that that is key, and, and that takes a lot of development from the onset. So we really, literally need to redevelop uh, a new layer that has all of those uh, intelligent features built in. Yeah, well, it seems like there's a lot of work to be done, and we are really at the, just the very beginning. And this question is actually for both you and Robbie, but I'll, I'll have Robbie answer it first. When we're talking about um, this entire concept, Web3 is hailed as a technology paradigm that is fueled by the creator economy and is in the future, or rather the next evolution of the internet, right? And as we draw evolutionary comparisons of the technology that underpinned everything from information consumption to content creation, Web2 contributed an unparalleled 
allowed economic growth and represented a very significant era in human evolution with new ways to work, uh, consumer information and progress in human civilization. It all contributed to that. So why this enormous, so, so with this enormous success of Web 2, why is there a need for Web 3, many would ask. Robbie, you go first. Sure. Um, simply put, I think it's the democratization of access to the financial underpinning of the internet. So because we can enable secure peer-to-peer -peer relationships, it means that we don't all have to play necessarily by the rules of large centralized organizations. It means that we can interact directly with each other as consumers. And the extent, logical extension of that is the creator economy is essentially peer-to-peer -peer because consumers are offering services to other consumers, whether it's you know, services in the physical world or you're doing work at a distance over the internet with people. And because we don't need to have a platform in between us, that changes the dynamic completely. I'm smiling because I love that answer. That was, in, in the simplest ways, such a great explanation. Shahal, I would love to hear your thoughts. Wow. I mean, it's the same way, but I'm going to look at it from a geopolitical angle. I mean, there are people that cannot control what the financial and the political system is doing. I mean, look what happened in Russia and Ukraine, what's going on in places like um, Iraq or Afghanistan or Israel, um, Palestine. I mean, these are things where there's a political force that people can't control. And then they get trapped within a system where Average human beings just want to be able to support themselves and their families, but they're, you know, sort of stuck within a geopolitical and financial system defined by their borders. And I think as we look for a future world, we want people to be able to interrelate with each other, regardless of culture and regardless of uh, anything else other than their own interests and their own recognitions within communities um, that they form together. And this is a platform that's going to allow them not only to do that, but also to be able to um, in, uh, you know, earn from it so they could actually be, be, be really free as human beings. And I think that's the innate reason and the philosophy why we're all doing this, because it's a huge lift. It's not easy, um, but that's the passion, I think, that drives all of us to give human beings really that freedom from this uh, sort of, uh, I don't want to use the word, but I have to, I think is what's coming to my mind, but this sort, sort of slavery that we're stuck in um, that doesn't define, I think, the evolution of um, what's going to happen in the future in the world. Very well said. Two great answers. Well, now we're officially out of time. But Robbie, if there's something you'd like to add, uh, you're so full of insight, please feel free before we say goodbye. I'm going to thank you for coming on a second time. And Shahal, it was a pleasure having you on. We do have a little, a couple more minutes left. So if there's anything you guys want to add, be my guest. Sure. I, I think Shahal really summed it up. I mean, I think... I think the exciting part is that, you know, this is really about financial inclusion and <clears throat> democratizing access more than anything. I think the thing that's amazing is when you think about the products that are having an impact in our segment, um, they're no longer simply products that are made, for example, in Silicon Valley and funded by venture capital firms there. You know, you look at Axie Infinity and we're talking about a product that is largely created in Vietnam and is largely played in terms of the bigger part of the player base by people in the Philippines and Venezuela. Now, realistically, the game could not have been a success also with a class of players that came from the US and came from Europe and other more developed economies, but they're able to play together in harmony. And I think the exciting thing is that we see really great companies coming from unexpected and, and non-traditional corners of the venture funded tech industry. And I think that's quite exciting. It is very exciting. And I'm so I'm I get chills knowing that I'm part of something that's so much bigger than we can all imagine. And in even just being at the forefront of all of this data and information coming in, um, I'm, I'm in my happy place. I'm a big Web3 enthusiast. Thank you, Zen. All right, Shahal, thank you so much for coming on. Robbie, what a pleasure having you on. Guys, make you. sure make sure you check out Animoca Brands. Head to their website, animocabrands.com. Go to tempest.network and make sure you also check them out on the gram. The bottom line is that the dataverse or the data economy is a big audacious goal. And our current patterns of thinking lead us to believe that big problems must be solved by big companies. However, much in the way Web3 has grown, the dataverse will not be the product of a centralized roadmap. Instead, it will emerge from an ecosystem of complementary products. And that's what you have to keep in mind. That was my digital 
Digital World brought to us by Tempest Network. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. <laughs> 